Welcome everyone. I'm Laura Mandel, JArt's Executive Director, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Studio Israel, a series that gives a peek into Israeli life and society through art. This conversation series is designed to give us a deep dive into some of the most important creative work that's coming out of Israel, of which there is much, and to frame the work through Brandeis academic expertise so that we can help uh, better understand the stories that the work is illuminating. This series is a collaborative effort, so I'm proud to welcome you all on behalf of, of course, the Jewish Arts Collaborative, the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies at Brandeis, the Hadassah Brandeis Institute, the Vilna Shul Boston Center for Jewish Culture, and of course, CJP Arts and Culture who helped make this program possible. So today we are in for a real treat with conceptual artist Gil Yefman. I came across Gil's Tum Tum series a few years ago and have been following ever since. Don't worry, you'll more, learn more about that shortly. Um, Gil is represented by the prestigious Shoshana Wayne Gallery in Los Angeles and has an incredible range of work that I'm excited for us to explore now in conversation with the brilliant Shana Weiss, Associate Director of the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies. So, please, so a bit about Gil to set the stage. Gil creates sculptures, videos, performances, installations, and two-dimensional works that are process-oriented and are often developed collaboratively. Using soft materials like felt and yarn, his practice considers difficult histories while imagining the potential for individual and collective healing. He uses archival materials as points of departure from which the knitting process resembles writing. Text and context become textures, suggesting alternative interpretations to dogmatic translations. Uh, Gail holds a BFA from the Betzalel Academy for Art and Design and is the Rappaport Prize winner for Young Artist Laureate in 2017 and uh, the 2010 Young Artist Prize by the Israeli Minister, Ministry of Culture. Of course, he's also had shows all over the world um, in Israel, the US, Japan, Germany, Sweden, and more. So at the end of the conversation, um, Jay Arts, editor of our new culture, digital arts and culture platform, Sarah Dower, will facilitate a question and answer period. So if you have questions, please hold them until then, or go ahead and put them in the chat, and Sarah will be sure to raise them um, so that Gil can speak to them. So on with the show, Shana. Go ahead and take it away. So oh. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all our sponsors, um, our tech support, and everyone who helped make today possible. But of course, thank you, Gil. I first encountered Gil, I was at the Tel Aviv Art Museum a couple of years ago, um, just sort of wandering around. Um, and I saw Gil's art, and I was looking at it, and I had never seen anything like it, you know. And all of a sudden, I noticed that there seemed to be some sort of donor tour perhaps that there was someone who seemed to be the artist um someone who worked at the art museum and a group of people who very clear were sort of the donors or some sort of vips and I, because i have no shame um i sort of hung around the back um and uh, accompanied the tour so i could learn a bit more and after it was over i just started talking to gil um once i realized that he was the artist and we had a really lovely conversation um, and we kept in touch. And as Laura said, he's been on my mind for a while. And I just knew we had to sort of be part of this series. Um, so I wanted to start by just asking, you know, about how you came to think about textiles and knitting and fabric as your maybe primary or one of the most one of the most common mediums that they use, right? What was this process like for you? How did you get into it? Um, yeah, let's talk about that. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Shana. Thank you, Laura and Sarah and everyone involved. And thank you so much for this kind invitation. Um, so yeah, that's a good question. And uh, yeah, I really love uh, textile and the way it uh, translates into texts and uh, context in relation to history, the body. Um, it's a, it has a lot of therapeutic uh, essence into it. And it's something that you can do just like kind of get over yourself and do like on a, in a social uh, context, like a, as knitting circles. And it's something that people just relate to whether they like it or not. I mean, we either wear it or play with it as kids. And then, you know, like the knitting and uh, textile are just part of our daily lives. So that's why 
it um I feel very comfortable well I, it kind of feels natural maybe to um to deal with trauma on a personal and collective level and uh, to kind of reclaim you know imagery back to our day-to-day -day reality and natural habitant yeah so and I, yeah. yeah and i also want to add you know we feel we already talked about this but so often knitting craft work this kind of this kind of work is often isn't really considered quote unquote art right by the establishment it's often associated with women right mm. or other groups so there's something really important right in reclaiming this i would argue i think you would agree too right this is sort of central um, yes exactly. Yeah. it has like the soft power into it and uh and then i also as a transgender feel um a very excluded for the bond from the bon ton kind of um uh, social status, you may say, I don't know. And um, then the otherness of being as such, uh, like just cling, clicks with the, with the, way, with the method of, um, of textile making and going into the fibers. You know, it's kind of also, I mean, I think it relates to the, the, the way that Foucault looks at language and uh, mm -hmm. like the patterns. And the patterns of thinking and the patterns of behaviorism, um, whether it's like personal, social, and so on, and also the lesson Guattari, they tell about like the rhizome, and that also has to do with felting very much, and like something that is more scattered and um, um, yeah, like you know loose. Yeah, um, you know, one of the first things I noticed, both when I saw your exhibit in Tel Aviv, but also looking at your body of work and preparing for this, is bodies, right? That there's all these bodies in your work. And a lot of times they're body parts, right? Um, you know, and they're very real and very embodied, right? To use an imperfect term, but they're often separate, right? And of course, this brings up so many things, violence, trauma, protection right and like amulets um can we talk about the role of your body of or bodies i should say not necessarily your body um and i you know and i thought especially one of your exhibits um tomb tomb would be a good way to do so great thank you so much this is a very good uh component of the work because we all have like body issues whether we like it or not and uh i mean study puts us in that in that position and uh so we're being told like you're not good enough you're not beautiful enough loved enough unless you change this that like external you know shape of your body and status and whatever and consumerism has to do with this and everything but um yeah so tum tum is actually like um one of the first major works that I've accumulated and like uh, it's a pre-medical biblical term from the Mishnah that the Rambam um, gathered and it relates to a human um, being with undeciphered genitalia and uh, gender and like intersex or transsexual or transgender in general and yeah, so it has a lot of performative essence. So I perform with this piece. We can hold a little this uh, slide and see um, that it does relate to a, a gushful, it's kind of a gender and sexual monstrosity that people are very much allowed to interfere with, touch, caress, and so on, and be part of this. Um, so, but then like, when you look at language at the young hebrew language then tum tum means um just uh, stupidity so the work was originally uh was created for um an exhibition that dealt with aspects of human stupidity in at the petr tikva museum and then later it evolved into uh, it, it participated at louis vuitton and here we see it at ron feldman gallery and smack melon and so on so it's very much kind of celebrated piece what was it like? Like, how did people react to it? We like we saw a little clip of it, but like, how did people react to it? Well, at first they were very much timid and kind of didn't know where to put themselves in relation to that. And I can totally understand. I mean, but then you know, I I just realized that the way I also treat the textile making is like writing, right? It's like the string of thoughts that connects 
And uh, with the needle, which is like really in the size of a pen, I actually create um, syllables, letters, and then whole sentences that uh, encompass the whole uh, object. And um, so you could also refer to various point of views or evidence and so on. So, you know, that kind of interesting that every person has a different connection point or, you know, we are all connected with this scheme and uh, they're just transcending time and space actually and culture. Yeah. yeah, one of the things that struck me right away about your work, both as, you know, personally as a Jewish person and thinking about, um, you know, Israeli society is of course the specter of the Holocaust, right? It looms, almost like a present absent, right? It looms so large. And yet, especially as survivors, you know, um, start, you know, really unfortunately have really started to die off, right? Um, it's the sort of thing that's there. And I was really struck by another exhibit of yours that I saw, Kibbutz Buchenwald, um, that I think says some interesting things about that or tries to think about that. So before I say what I think, um, maybe let's look at that a bit and you'll ex and explain this piece and talk it through with us a bit um, and then we'll talk about it a bit more. So the video, basically, what we saw was um, um, uh, the introduction to a video, which is a major piece in that show. Um, and it has to do with two figures. And the Hitler-like figure is played by Dov Ornel, who's a um, um, pioneering conceptual art in Israel. He's a Holocaust survivor as well. He was born in 1927. And um, so he's 95 today, or towards six. and. Uh, and he plays not Hitler, but the the character has to do with um, like combining his dad that was murdered in Auschwitz and Hitler together. So it's kind of putting the um, poison and medicine right together and kind of reflect on that connection of the perpetrator and the victim in one go. And uh, the other person, the other uh, persona is uh, played by myself. Her name is Penelope and she's um, also like a very um, round figure, has to do with histories, minor histories, Africa, um, the like the first genocide of the 20th century, which took place in Namibia and so on. And uh, actually the, the name Kibbutz Buchenwald, so, uh, sorry, so the video is a collage of like these two figures going through whatever remained from Buchenwald, so like the Buchenwald uh, Memorial and, um, and a green screen studio. And it kind of um, uses the power of imagination to connect the gap between memory and history. And the exhibition takes its name, Kibbutz Buchenwald, from a very short episode from the history of Zionism, basically. Um, so a group of uh, um, survivors, uh, 15, uh, survivors from um, from Buchenwald uh, who were just kids you know so they were very much concerned about the, the, the um, about the future of the youth of Europe after World War II and um, they with the help of um, an American uh, army rabbi whose name is Schechter and Marcus so they um, they uh, established a farm and they they called it kibbutz Buchenwald. So actually they pursued the kibbutz notion. Um, and um, then they immigrated to Palestine later to become Israel and operated as kibbutz Buchenwald here. 
Um, after two years, or after four years, basically of them being a kibbutz, uh, Ben Gurion and the kibbutz movement um, leaders, they um, made them change their name, and uh, because it wasn't like Hebrew enough, but we all know they wanted to focus on, on like um, bravery and not like uh, on being survivors from the camp, which of course to me is bravery, and um, so it's all about alternative cultural heroes and um, and then they chose the name Netzel, Netzel Chaim and then later uh, with the um, um, joining of Givat Brenner Kibbutz they received the name Netzel Sereni which is operating still today. So Netzel Sereni has the archive of Kibbutz Buchenwald and, um, and, and um, that was like uh, the name of the exhibition and the context where I acted and collaborated with Dov Orner, Cucinata Collective, which is a collective of African asylum seekers, women, and Lilach mm -hmm. Neist um, that also helped us with um, um, with um, uh, research, and Adida Han from Telvi Museum curated it. And what was that was part of the Rappaport Prize. So I think a lot of it connects to nature and gender and. Um, like nature in a sense of romantic nature, but also like human nature, which is could be totally opposite to that and very destructive. Um, sorry, I'm talking a lot, Shana. Would you yeah, like no, and I just want to say, I want to just clarify that the flag that we saw earlier, right? That's the actual flag, right? From Kibbutz Buchenwald. The exhibit has this really interesting mix of historical objects, objects that feel like they could be historical objects, but maybe aren't, right? And um, sort of creative spaces. Um, so related to that, you know, one of the things we talked about is that, um, you know, you have this interest in, I would say, really like Yiddish and Ashkenazi heritage, right? Something that we know, right, that the early Zionists um, were actively disparaging against, right? It's not common to meet an, um, an Israeli, right, let's say, unless they're of an older survivor, basically, who's interested, for example, in the poetry of um, Abraham Suskever, right? You have another work um, that's titled Bermir Dispistu Shane, right, a famous Yiddish song. So I just wanted to ask, first of all, how did you discover these people, right? This is, again, it's not part of the common discourse in Israel, and talk a bit yeah. more about the sort of world of Yiddish and Ashkenazi heritage in your, in your work. For sure. Thank you. Yes, definitely. I mean, not just that, but just connecting it also with minor histories that, uh, you know, of these like uh, women, African women, you know, asylum seekers and so on. I mean, we're all part of the same, basically, history and stories. And, um, and um, well, the Holocaust survivors, I mean, they were considered to be like, uh, they were even named soaps because they were not they were very much disliked by the native Israelis that were very preoccupied with their fighter imagery and like being machoistic and so on. And they couldn't even tolerate them. And they kind of asked for their moral, uh, you know, the question, their morals and so on. So um, I felt the need to connect and to, to kind of give it a, a second thought and uh, to, to really put, to, shift hierarchies and bring both the um, nowadays uh, um, victims of persecutions are that are part of my daily environment like in south of tel aviv you know my studio is next to the studio of cucinate and then um i ask them to host um uh um yeah with the help of malka fund uh, from the United mm -hmm. States as well. So uh, we they could host and um, manage a, a knitting circle to which the audience were invited. And um, and also we did it with Amcha here, like Holocaust Survivors uh, a Social Club. And um, so 265 volunteers came and knitted with us this headshow, which actually uh, has to do, yeah, that's how it looked. It was very beautiful atmosphere. And the hetero actually takes uh, its inspiration from um, a document from 1943, where Rudolf Hess, the commander of Auschwitz, instructs his troops to bring uh, plants, trees, and shrubs in order to create a green belt that would cover the way to the crematorium. So, you know, you, again, you can see like how nature is being cynically used 
um, to disguise the total opposite and the horrific. And um, I think a lot of the Yiddish um, also was discarded, like the Yiddish culture is still discarded and not, you know, uh, celebrate fully celebrated in Israel. And next to my studio, there's also like Jung Yiddish Center, which also gives a lot of inspiration and comfort. And uh, by Mir Bistushain, yeah, this that that was the name of uh, my exhibition at Feldman. Um, yeah, and it also had to do with the role of women uh, in the Holocaust and um, also non-Jewish, you know, that were coerced into these uh, um, brothels that were operated in the camps. And that was very another unfortunate uh, part of history that still kind of violence against women during wartime is still considered to be like, you know, taken for granted or dis disregarded, you know, like this very bad. I can say from a Jewish studies point of view, the study of sexual violence during the Holocaust is only now, honestly, within the past couple of years, starting to be taken seriously as a subject of research, as things of discussion, and that sort of thing. And of course, there are other, you know, multiple other examples as well. You know, you had this amazing project, right, bringing together groups that I don't think most people would associate, right, with elderly Holocaust survivors, young, um, mostly non-Jewish asylum seekers, women from Africa. Um, what was that like? Like, can you just reflect on that personally a bit? Like, I found, I found those pictures so moving, right? Like, how did, you know, yeah, what was that like for you? Well, I was like the best, you know, it's one of the peak of my careers, definitely. I mean, uh, uh, I'm halfway through maybe, but uh, still it's <laughs> like, there's so much to aspire to. And like these women are going through so much and they're being, I mean, first Cucinata was uh, established by two amazing women. Can you say uh, a word about Cucinata just so our, yes, our audience yes, knows who they yes. are? Yes, so Cucinata, I highly recommend to check yourself. Um, so Cucinata means um, crochet in Tigrinian, in the, the spoken language of Eritrea. And um, um, and the two women that established uh, this uh, psychosocial project are Didi Maimon Cohen, who's a psych psychotherapist, and uh, Aziza Kidena, she's uh, a nun, sister. And um, she's uh, the mother of the Eritrean community in Israel. And like, they just give answer, like they give answer, like they give uh, um, uh, a common ground to women who actually undergone through hell and still do in Israel society nowadays. And, um, but you know, abduction and rape and like uh, really horrible stuff. That stuff that I cannot show them in my studio, like that I do, you know, like for instance, all these gender and all these body organs that might trigger a lot. So I, you know, my first collaboration, I collaborate with them since 2015 on and off, you know, it depends on basically on, on the budget that I can accumulate or not. And um, also with Dovel and I, I collaborate since 2015. So, you know, it bringing all these different parts together is brings a lot of inspiration for me, like working with communities and on a social standard, like on social ground. For me, it, 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 it's a way to, to, to get to places that could not go on my own, you know, so. Um, you know, we already talked about a bit the connection between text and textile. And one of the things that also struck me about your work is how deeply grounded it is in Jewish texts. Um, we talked about Tum Tum. There's, of course, the Holocaust imagery. Um, you also have a work called, you know, the Valley of Wet Bones, right, that we could bring up. And I just wanted if we could talk about what is your relationship like, right, to the Sort of vast world of Jewish text, especially as a visual artist, right? What does this act of translation look like? Thank you, great. Yes, I mean, this is a project I really, really love. And I've, um, like the Valley of Wet Bones was realized during an artist in residence in Japan. I was invited to Aomori Contemporary Art Center. Um, and I had to come up with a project that I kind of connected. You know, I thought, what could I, Bring that would connect Japanese um, society and 
you know, my heritage, my um, cultural references, and um, basically the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is like huge, like, you know, it's exponentially grows. Um, uh, it's a strife, it's ecological strife, and we're amidst that as well. And so I thought to connect that uh, with the prophecy of Ezekiel, of the dry bones, of course, the Valley of Dry Bones. And, uh, but can you just say, sorry, a, can you just say a, like a, like one sentence about what that is to because make sure we're oh, on the oh, same page. Sorry. Uh, so the prophecy of Ezekiel of the, the Valley of Dry Bones is basically the people of Israel go through the desert and basically they are wandering around and lost and, um, well, moral, moral decay or some sort, you know, and uh, then God, the father figure almighty, um, in his dream, of course, in the Ezekiel dream, like he uh, puts flesh in the, in that these dry bones, put, uh, brings them back to life and shows them the way back to the holy land, the promised land, uh, which we're happily in, I mean, me. Um, so, you know, um, so basically this story, um, yeah, I mean, as nice as it would be, you know, to believe in that, then still, I would have to put mama nature into the equation and to also rethink about ways of uh, of rejuvenating, bringing to life, you know, dead materials such as plastic bags. So the plastic and shopping bags, uh, like the trash and shopping bags, you know, like in one sentence, because you cannot really differentiate sometimes between the shopping bag and and the actual good so i mean and the trash i mean it's all kind of so much plastic that we live on and so we kind of shredded it created yarn and then um knitted uh, bones in which we put soil and uh, grass and plants and we kind of suspended them in the air as if they were uh, coming to life again and I have to say that the Japanese um, uh, group of women that we worked together, um, there were so, like, that was such an amazing, again, such an amazing experience because not everyone knew each other and, um, or were fond of each other, but through this process, which is labor intensive, then like they, they came to know each other better and created very beautiful friendships and, um, yeah and so for me it's always like reading like into a like dogmatic mm -hmm. text and kind of bring out value from it like alternative value yeah academics sometimes call that like reading against the grain right or you know but I love this idea of bringing in like a feminine mother nature back into what is a very masculine text and also corpus right you know it's not news right that the Jewish body of text that's very male in a very you know standard way um so related to that um one of the things that really struck me in your body of work is this performance piece um called one summer evening which mm. is sort of a tribute um of a very important israeli poet right chaim nachman bialik who sort of if you know if you know like one israeli poem ever from like your one class or whatnot it's from this guy um, and the way you choose to pay homage to it is, I think, in a different way than maybe some of the other Bialik tributes that um, some of you have known or some of you have seen. So I was wondering if we could um, look at that piece and think about, think about that as well. So. חוטי כסף מזהירים, והן אורגות כסות אחת לכהנים גדולים ולמגדלי חזירים. היה ערב הקיץ, כל הבתים נתרוקנו ונתמלאו הגנים. יצא אדם כדרכו במאווייו הגדולים לחטאיו הקטנים. קצרה רוח האדם, כלו עיני מייחל, ותפילתו האחת, הכוכבים הצנועים, מהרו צאתכם מלמעלה, והקדשות מתחת.
ובגן זה החלה נגינה קלה, עוללה, והגן כולו נמאה. ומבין האילנות הנה השחיר זנב צעיף, והלבינה כנף סינר. וכסרסורי אבירה קורצים, רומזים, כוכבים, ועיניהם פז טובעות. צרה רוח הזנוני גם את יסבות השדה ואת אבני הרחובות. ומאמצע הנהר וממרומי הגזוזרות ומאחרי הגדרות בא הצחוק ובחלונות מורדים וילונות וקווים הנרות. הס. השאר נתן ריחו זולל שובע העולם, יין אגבים עברו, והוא יוצא מדעתו ומתגולל בקיאו ומתבוסס בבשרו, ובנות ליליות זכות שוזרות מוזרות בלבנה, חוטי כסף מזהירים, והן אורגות כסות אחת לכוהנים גדולים, וילים גדלי חזירים. Right, so this piece was, uh, it's a video, video uh, installation and uh, performative video. Um, I play both roles of the believer, like the Orthodox believer and uh, a sex worker um, that is like, has this alternative um, um, dress, like a you know, kind of biblical dress. And um, well, I ate a lot of, sorry my French shit about this work and uh, because it's very easily misinterpreted and becomes this populistic uh, victim of you know other motives but nevertheless the work was done innocently and with um, with an intention to thought provoke but never just to provoke and uh, to kind of bring forth uh, a possibility of um, a dialogue, a dialogue a better dialogue and to lower the sanctuary sanctity of these objects that are more more precious than people's lives you know people who are actually are not allowed to practice the the this religion and just today i read that uh, the kotel is like you know it's hot news and this work like they i mean women are treated so bad in in uh in nowadays like uh in terms of uh, uh judaism and um and so you know faith is something that should be free for all um to practice i you know i'm a believer and um so so as much as i have deep respect towards the religion and still i you know followed bialik who wrote this poem more than a century ago and um And uh, it, it's, a, it's a poem that is all about the hypocrisy of the Orthodox society of his time, that on one stand, like, you know, they do the right, they believe it does the right thing, dress the right dress code and so on, and do the mitzvahs, but he actually waits for the Shabbat to pass in order to go to the gardens and have his ways with hookers and so on, uh, with sex workers, sorry, like it's not, uh, so basically I always feel The need to identify with the outcasts and uh, to kind of shift point of views and um yeah to give it a, a more you know even a playful like uh, um visualization of this poem and i was a transgender like a transsexual at that time you know i'm just a transgender now but uh, i used to take hormones and appear as a woman and as um and um and then i was constantly harassed on a daily basis by um you know and i felt like oh no i must do something and i want to do something and uh and i had to uh, it was a time i was kind of trying to escape art really but i failed so i just now fully committed you know more than ever and uh yeah so 
you know, I'm very proud of this work. I think it uh, and it was it was made like this. And uh, thank you, Eran, mm -hmm. for reading this poem so beautifully. And um, yeah, I mean, I would love to answer some questions, maybe. But you know, it is what it is. Yeah. No, I find it so powerful. Also, like thinking about that poem, right? Like, you know, as Bialik does, right? His object is his object of critique, right? Is the Orthodox society. But what if we thought about the sex workers, right? This person visits, like, what are they experiencing? What are they thinking, right? Again, the sort of reading against the grain, taking from the margins and moving that to the center is just something I found, found so powerful in this. Um, and that, yeah, and of course it is, sh it is shocking, but it's not being, it's not shocking for shocking sake. It's shocking with a very deep engagement for me, at least with Jewish tradition, Israeli history that I found really, really moving. Um, we are moving towards the question and answer period. So I wanna end with me. I'm going to end with, what are you working on now? I know you just got back from Berlin. Um, I think, right, you were in Berlin most recently. I was in Frankfurt. Um, Frankfurt, I'm sorry. No offense, to, Frank no offense to Berlin, you were in Frankfurt. Um, <laughs> very important for, yeah, for German Jewish history and myself. Um, if you could, yeah, just what are you working on now? What does sort of the future hold? And then we'll go to questions. Sure. I just want to come back a little to the to the to the to the making of the one summer evening. Yeah. Sorry, just just to mention that I would, you know, I would never like uh, burn uh, uh, an, a holy object or you know, um, I mean, or um, hurt it in any way. The tefillin was made from cardboard, and it's so easy to just, you know, because the the real ones were also very small, and like I. I couldn't get a hold on that and I didn't want to because it's all about symbols and you know mm -hmm. symbols have so much power and uh, people just are affected that easily and I don't want to create too much attention I would rather affection and this kind of work was very potent and very you know um, very crucial at the time it still is I don't know but yeah anyway so I'm working towards always looking ahead right um, so I'm glad to share that I'm going to have a, my first solo show at Shoshana Wayne Gallery during this summer. Yes, so much to much to prepare and to hope so for. So that will be in and, LA. Uh, yes, that will be in LA. Okay. And I'm uh, yeah, I'm currently working um, in the realm of disability studies uh, in uh, in Israel in this Mifala uh, Pais uh, and so on. So I'm pretty busy. Oh, and I just had a, at a, um, a big um, ceiling installation at the um, Kiria Recycling Center. So it's like the largest trash dump of Israel. And I'm so fortunate to be able to work in this uh, sphere and to, you know. We'll talk about this trash dump exhibit because I don't think we would usually think of trash dump as a place to put art. That's true. Gil, if you want to tell us about that. Mm -hmm. So that was a very, that's a very good point because it's not like a sterile um, space, not like a museum like. So a lot of visitors from all ages, from all uh, walks of life. And it was such a great opportunity to connect on that vast, um, um, on this large common ground and, and to create something that everyone can do and can pass on to one another and um, to act within. So, you know, it's kind of a poetic act uh, of resistance to our um, compulsive um, consumerism and so on. I mean, 70% of the trash that we dump on earth is plastic bags and like, um, so it's, it's, still, it's still going on. I mean, it's, it's real war now. I mean, with our devilish functions, you know. So did they invite you to do this piece? Yes, like yes, how yes. did it? It was an open call, actually. And um I think more than 100 artists applied, and I'm so lucky to be chosen. And uh uh Adia Kutieli is uh um was curating that. And I must say it was just a pleasure working in this uh in this place, you know, and it was a good commission. Uh, I mean, it was great, great, very rewarding in every sense you can think of. Great. So I just want to make sure people, so people are 
then sort of almost knitting with plastic bags, right? Or knitting with material made from well, plastic almost bags. completely. Yeah, yes. completely. Okay. Yes, I can demonstrate. So maybe. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's very right, easy. But I so it invited the public to like be part of the process. And that's Absolutely. Really yeah. The more the merrier. Definitely. I mean, yeah. that was also so powerful at Kibbutz Buchenwald because it wasn't so such an easy story to take. And also mm -hmm. like the um, kind of political climate was not the best, not that it's amazing now, but you know, yeah. it's like, it could always get worse, right? And um, <laughs> so, so having already so many people engaged in part of the creation of the exhibition gives a lot of power to the exhibition and, 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 and jumps it, like it kind of um, give it a, give it a, you know, a better grounding into reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a perfect segue. I'm gonna pass it over to Sarah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I wish you could see everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, yeah. Well, thank you, Shayna, and thank you, Gil. Um, we're so excited for your solo show in LA. Um, Someone was wondering if you could name the LA Gallery again because they missed it. I'm sure we all Shoshana want to know. Wayne. Shoshana Wayne Gallery. Awesome. We, we can also put that in the chat. Um, but I, I think what you were just talking about with Shayna and you touched on a little bit um, before is how um, I think the question really is, you know, we're dealing with a political climate, at least here in the US, which but there's a lot of talk about censorship, um, which I'm sure is something you think about in your work as you're exploring, you know, things we cannot accept as a society, as a people. Um, and I'm curious about how your work has been received in the different places you have been exhibited, you know, Japan versus Israel versus Berlin, Frankfurt. Um, and if you've you've come into any situations where you had to think differently based on the culture you're in, or if you learned anything um, about the culture you were in and in sharing your work. Sure. Wow, what a deep question. Thank you. I mean, um, it's an ongoing process, you know. Uh, our cultural differences uh, are there. And uh, of course, my intentional my best intentions are um, are there, but from the moment on where I create the piece and it's on its own, then that's it. You know, I can hope for the best and expect the worst, basically, and um, which is fine by me. Um, so, but I do get a lot of uh, good reactions and uh, inspiring uh, insights, and every time it's from a different, unexpected angle. Really, it's like uh, I think. Being a transgender was also very helpful to kind of get mm, not the best reactions where you actually hope, like you actually expect, and then on the contrary, get the best reactions from an encouragement from people you would never think, you know, they would like you. But, you know, so um, as long as my art, you know, make people think and feel even better and um, and communicate and that's where I'm so happy, you know, and uh, yeah, wandering around the world is very helpful to get a better sense of existence uh, just as a human being, which is not taken for granted. I'm very happy. <laughs> um, and a lot of folks were curious about um, the participatory process of your work and specifically uh, the process at the Re recycling center. Um, and the question is, you know, did you engage with the workers there? Were they a part of the process um, for this piece? And if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, uh, Mira Ladderman, Euclid, like she's a New York based, uh, amazing artist. Actually, she's Israeli based now, right now. She's like work, worked with the sanitary uh, department in New York. So like more participatory than her, I could never be. And she's like great inspiration, but, but the answer, of course, is yes. Like first, the more the merrier people uh, engaging with the piece become the piece and making decisions. And you know, uh, it's I love the um, uh, Mira Ladderman Euclid. That's the name. And um, 
Um, she's also at Feldman. And um, so, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the workers at the, um, at the um, um, Ecological Educational Center, of course, and the, the, the um, education department, of course, you know, and uh, everyone. Um, so, yeah, it really gives a, an added value, definitely. I mean, for me, it's, it's amazing. Some, some things I do like to do on my own. So I think that it's good that there is, you know, you know your, you know, role. And I mean, it's nice also to lose yourself. I mean, of course, how can you not? I mean, but then also kind of as a control, I'm a little bit of control freak myself sometimes. So, you know, I get to, I get a hang of, like, it's all about balance, you know? I, that's, yeah, let's end there. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I'm just kidding, bring on the questions. Oh my goodness. Um, I, I'm wondering because of your, your ecological work and the center of, of your work being about, you know, climate change um, and the environment, if this has affected like the materiality of, of your other work, whether how you think about past work, how you're thinking about future work, um, or, and I, I also would love if you could describe, because we're not in the room with it, like the feel and the texture of, of the plastic bags, for example, versus the, the yeah. softness of, the, of what you've worked with before. Thank you. Thank you so much for this amazing question. Um, <clears throat> yes, it does has a lot of uh, influence, like climate change has a lot of influence on my choices of uh, and so I would say time consuming labor intensive work that I just put a lot of effort on just one object that is also foldable so I can like ship it very easily and not spending too much, like not just the money, but just like the get the fuel and everything, you know, and uh, so I yeah I do want to work with or like I'm. Um, um, I love working with like organic um, materials. Uh, think about subst like substantiality and uh, and the labor intensive and to raise awareness with my work like it's never just the object it's always like the process and um, who is involved where is it shown uh, and so on um, I mean the plastic bags are toxic uh, very much uh, and they're also not last forever I mean it won't it, I mean, it decomposes itself. Some of the installation already it, it decomposes itself uh, on the people's head, and uh, <laughs> you know, so, some some collectors always also find it disturbing. Like the collectors want their art to live forever, and you know, nothing lives forever. I mean, I don't know what kind of uh, wish is that. I mean, um, I mean, you know, I always uh, try to tell to insinuate. Okay, you will not last forever. Fortune will not last forever. I'm not going to last forever. The art is, and sometimes, yeah, I do feel, you know, I don't want to sound too harsh, but sometimes I feel like, uh, you know, just stopping manufacturing mechanism is a great cause for, like, is great art, you know? So, and I'm not the first one to, to invent like uh, self-destructive art, I mean, yeah, just, you know, maybe if I wasn't knitting, I would do explosives. <laughs> <laughs> just a joke. Just a joke. <laughs> just a joke, but that's also an, an intervention in itself. And so much of your work has to do with intervention. Um, I, I th It's interesting. I think there is a, uh, and someone in the comments, tell me the name of it. There's a Jewish way of, of getting rid of things, or what, getting rid of ritual Absolutely. objects. Yeah. Uh -huh. um yeah please continue to send in questions yes thank you Shayna. yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah so yeah. even even in jewish tradition there's there's ways of thinking about this and how things should decompose and and just like Absolutely. people um i must say i must add the dove O'Neill, whose work is so amazing and we're like uh i wish there would be like a great archive online that people can actually check and easily connect with but he's like Geniza and um, the ecological aspect of his work already since early 70s is so potent and so inspiring to so many people in Israel and beyond. 
I mean, his work is so, he's, he's a really real mentor. I mean, he's amazing. Wow. What, uh, oh, this is a good question. What was the first thing you knitted? Also, who oh my God. you how to knit? Yeah, well, um, well, although my, my grandma and, and my mother did knit or do, um, uh, I, I didn't learn from them. I was actually doing my, um, my um, work at the Jerusalem Cinematheque that I started to knit, you know, while I was an asher there. But basically, on my first year at Betzalel, I created a Mike Kelly's piece without knowing who Mike Kelly was. And Mike Kelly, another amazing LA artist that is working with soft materials and like the uncanny and, and so prolific. And uh, so, so I think soft materials, I mean, I took all my childhood dolls, uh, made like portraits like of them, and then um, reassembled them uh, or like really unraveled them and then reconnected them as a punching bag that was hanged from the ceiling and uh, along with the, their picture around. And uh, yeah, I was like uh, struck by his work. And uh, yeah, and, and let me tell you, maybe I'm, I'm, um, um, I'm not, uh, I'm ADHD without like the stamp, you know, and yeah. So people cannot see maybe, but I am. So actually, as soon as I start to knit, it's like a, another sense opens up and I am I know where I'm coming from, where I'm going to. Everything makes sense in a way, even if it's total madness. And uh, it really, really soothes my nerves and brings out more meaning to my existence. Mm. So, yeah. Uh, um. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about other artists, um, despite, uh, aside from the the two that you already mentioned, who have a great impact on your work, um, uh, who have in the past, who are some artists, maybe collaborators that you've worked with that really continue to inspire you. Yeah, so Dove or Nair for sure, and hopefully for many more years. And the Cucinate Collective, of course, I mean, they're, they're so amazing. And, um, you know, um, so, you know, a lot of artists that I love actually died. But Lee Bowery, you know, is an amazing artist, um, like another pioneer. And uh, just now Vivian Westwood recently died and she was so fond of Lee and like uh, took so much inspiration from his designs. And he's relation to the body so um so strong you know you would do stuff only he could wear because it entails so much pain and so much like embarrassment you know and stuff like that so yeah Paul McCarthy is another great artist uh, but again like there are so many I mean Louise Bourgeois and uh um her exhibition at the Jewish Museum in New York recently like last year was just amazing you know I was in relation to Freud um Annette Massage you know like a lot a lot a lot also in the Israeli realm I mean as uh Shana no uh Laura told like there are so many great artists around here uh, young and old and like uh, from all you know from various backgrounds and just amazing to celebrate this year mm. just and wish we had more institution more money more market you know that keeps things going but, oh uh, don't we all <laughs> all the artists never give up <laughs> yeah um and it's so interesting for those who are watching if you don't know lee bowery's work you definitely need to look that up right now um, I see so much, I see how he's inspired your work um, and what we've seen here today. Um, and I guess I'm wondering in, in thinking about queer art and queer artists, um, what is it like, um, you know, being a queer artist in Israel today? Well, it's not easy to be a queer anything in Israel today, uh, least of all an artist. I mean, it's like, um, you know, it's not easy to be a lot of things in Israel, you know, just uh, 
having to, you know, serve the armies, you know, pay taxes, you know, the usual and stuff like all the the, the things that we, we love to do for our countries. And, uh, but we still don't get basic rights back, like, uh, you know, bringing up kids and, uh, and, and marriage and, and all and apotropos and everything, you know, like just basic human rights that, so people actually do the duties, but they don't receive the rights back. And this is a shame, like this doesn't supposed to happen. Um, so, but yeah, there's still so much to accomplish. So again, without being too salty about it um, or uh, bitter, uh, let's just, uh, you know, put some music and keep on dancing to people's faces. Like, mm. you know, not, not like happy, happy, joy, joy, stupidly, but uh, although that's also nice, but just like, you know, to to keep our faith and to to act with our integrity and not giving up and not be afraid and yeah that's wonderful thank you so much gil for this conversation for joining us and also for all the work the art that you put out into the world um it's so important and we're looking forward to everything that is to come for you um you can check out more of gil's work at the link in the chat um, thank you again to Shayna, um, all of our partners who are listed at the top of the program. And if you're looking for a recording of this uh, Studio Israel, um, next week we will have a digital version out on YouTube so you can revisit it as much as you'd like. Um, and also it will be on culture.org. Uh, that's K-O-L-T-U-R-E.org. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone who participated. See you soon, I hope. Yeah, see you soon.